Joshua chapter number three, let's read verses, uh, beginning with verse number 14. And down to the end of the chapter, we'll have a word of prayer and um, we'll kind of uh, uh, review just a little bit. We've been talking about the Jordan River, the Jordan River. We looked at the Jordan River last week and uh, we talked about anticipating the Jordan River. All right. And we uh, went through that. Now we're going to look at a couple of more things and hopefully finish up chapter number three, chapter number four, or part of chapter number four. Verse number 14, and it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan and the priest bearing the ark of the covenant before the people. And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap very far from the city Adam, <clears throat> that is beside Zaratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho and the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. Brother Dave, would you lead us in prayer, please? Father, we're so thankful for this, uh, your word that gives us some history, some understanding, some insight into the wonderful miracles that you performed for your people, Israel. We thank you so much for allowing us to understand that, to give us wisdom into your word that we might apply it to the life that we have this day. That we live for thee, Father, to serve thee and all the glory that you are not have us to do. I pray that you be with us this evening. You help us to understand what the pastor has provided for us for his study. Help us to understand those things that we might be better servants under thee. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Dave. Now, last study, we looked at anticipating Jordan. I'm, this time, we're going to look at navigating the Jordan. Navigating the Jordan. I want you to look, first of all, that the, the period of time in the crossing. They're getting ready to cross, but there's a period of time that they're going to cross. And, uh, you know, there's nothing impossible with God, right? Amen. He doesn't go by the calendar. He doesn't look to see if it's a full moon or anything like that. He's going to do what he wants to do because he created the moon and the stars and the sun. And, uh, you know, these folks will talk about Mother Nature. You know, it's, a, it's amazing. <clears throat> they'll, they'll say, you know, when the weather's good, they'll say, oh, Mother Nature gave us a good day. But when there's a tornado or a hurricane, it's an act of God. <laughs> Why is the bad things attributed to God and the good things attributed to Mother Nature? God's in control of all of it, right? Amen. So look at, the, look at the period of time in the crossing. Verse number 15, that last phrase in parentheses. For Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest. Now, overflowing banks. Over, could, could God have picked a better time for Israel? Sure he could. He could have picked a time in the spring, maybe in the winter, but it's harvest and it's um, and the banks of the Jordan River are overflowing. Some one one commentator said it's it, it almost spread out miles from the banks, and so God could have picked out a better time. But overflowing banks is not unmatched by God's overflowing power, Amen. right? So, um, I, and I'm thinking about what God does for us. You know, even before we pray, He knows what we need. In fact, the scripture says, above all that we ask or think. Now, look at Psalm 114, because this kind of, this uh, goes along with what we're looking at here. Psalm 114, and in just a minute, we're going to turn to the book of Habakkuk. How about that? I'll give you that right now, so you can spend the next five minutes looking it up. Uh, Psalm 114, and then Habakkuk chapter number three. But I'm going to turn to Psalm 114 first. And you may want to jot this down, go back to it later, okay? You say, well, when it comes to a back, that's what I'll do. <laughs> so uh, Psalm 114, look at verse number five. And, and I want you to identify these bodies of water for me, okay? 
Now the psalmist says in Psalm 114, verse number five, what ailed thee, O thou sea, that thou fleddest? All right, what body of water was that? The Red Sea, the Red sea right? And of course the other one is identified right here. He says, O thou sea that fleddest, thou Jordan, that thou wast driven back. So God mentions both of these bodies of water here in this verse. And he said, what ailed thee? Why did, you, why did the Red Sea part, uh, part? Why was the Jordan driven back? I'll tell you why. Man couldn't do it. God did that. And so they did that. They did that. They parted by the strength and the power, the almighty wisdom of God. God did that. Now, are we in Habakkuk yet? Habakkuk chapter number three. Now, I'm turning there. I don't have it marked, so I may just embarrass myself right here. And uh, Joshua, we're in Joshua. I'm far from uh, Nahum Habakkuk. All right, here we go. Habakkuk chapter number three. Now, the first part of that, what read, it says, Thy bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word, Selah. <clears throat> now, watch this. Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. All right? Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. Now, when you see a body of water going through the middle of a, the land, whether it's through mountains, through valleys, whatever, God did that. God cleaved or separated uh, the land by using water, right? You know, you know what these, uh, if you watch some of these, sci, not, not sci-fi, but uh, uh, history channels or, or the scientific channels and, oh, they're going to tell you that, uh, you know, there's a great comet that hit the earth and, and caused the, uh, uh, the, the mountains to form and the valleys and, the, and especially, look, especially the Grand Canyon. Look, the flood did that. We know that. We, we know what did that. There's nothing more powerful than a great flood that would do that. Yeah, but that's, uh, that's being formed millions and millions of millions. No, God can do it in a week or less than that if he wanted to. So, <clears throat> so look what he says. Thou, thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. Now, sometimes God cleaves the earth with rivers. And then sometimes he cleaves the rivers without the earth. <laughs> and he did that with the Jordan. Now, one day... In Revelation chapter 16, one day God is going to dry up the Euphrates River. He's going to dry it up. It's not going to be an act of nature. It's not going to be mother nature. It's not going to be father time. Not going to be, it will be an act of God though, by the way. God's going to do that. But the Bible says that one day God's going to dry up the Euphrates that the way of the kings of the east may be prepared. God's going to do that. He still has control over everything that takes place on this earth. And so if they want to scare you by saying a great comet is going to hit this earth, they don't know that. They don't know that. God, if, if something is headed our way, God can dissolve it just like that if he wants to. He's still in control. Don't let, that, don't let these people scare you. Let's, go, let's just believe what the Bible has to say. Amen. Well, if, boy, if that, if that comet hits the earth, we're goners. Well, are you saved? Then you're going to heaven, okay? All right. So the period of time in the crossing, that was at the overflowing the Jordan River, and then the position of the ark in the crossing. If you look at verse number 14 again, and it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people. Now between Israel and and the impossibility of the Jordan, there is an ark. And that ark represents our Savior who can do all things. You see, Jesus has already paved the way for us. And ladies and gentlemen, you don't need a bridge over troubled waters. <laughs> all you need is for God to control. All you need is for God to open up that river or open up that sea and that and, and, and there will be a dry road that will lead you through those waters. God still does that. I don't care what Simon and Garfunkel Steen says. <laughs> or whatever. But isn't it true that he leads us in paths of righteousness 
for his name's sake. I'm glad. Look what else it says here. Not only anticipating Jordan and navigating Jordan, but go to chapter number four now, and let's look at the first three verses. And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan. I like that phrase. As you saw that phrase in verse 17, we're passed clean over Jordan. And he says, clean pass over Jordan, verse number one, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, take you 12 men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, 12 stones, and ye shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Now that took place. Now here's what I want to uh, here, here's what I want you to see. Not only they were anticipating Jordan, not only were they navigating Jordan, but in the end they're going to commemorate Jordan. And here God is going to set up two things. Number one, He's going to set up some memorials, some memorials. God wants to do that. In fact, we just did that last Sunday night, didn't we? When we had the Lord's Supper, that is a memorial of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, where we take the grape juice that is a, is a symbol of his blood, and that bread is a symbol of his broken body. God is in memorials. I wish our country would realize that. Instead of pulling them down and breaking them up and destroying them and melting them, right. taking away our history, so that our kids are not going to grow up and, one, and, and, and realize how great this country was founded and the sacrifice that took place with great people, great people that God used in my estimation. Well, here God's going to establish a memorial. And, and a memorial is simply this. It's, it's that they might remember what God has done. Now, God is going to set up two different sets of 12 stones. Number one, there's going to be an invisible memorial. Look at verse number nine. Verse nine. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood, and, there, and, and they are there unto this day. Now, first of all, God sets up an invisible memorial. Now, only, no, I say that, I said all that to say this. Only the eyes of God can see that. After they cross over Jordan, the waters are going to go back into place, and they're not, they're not going to see that memorial. It's underwater. And it's not going to be clear enough to see because Jordan was muddy all the time. It's going to be invisible to everyone except God. God's eyes are going to be upon it. Now, I want you to think about Calvary for just a second. Think about Jesus dying upon that cross. Think about what took place. It was so awful and yet so holy that only the eyes of God could look upon it. And it got so bad that God had to turn the sun off for a little while. And it got so bad that he had to forsake his son for a little while because Jesus would stretch out his arms. As he stretched out his arms, he would look up and he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so nobody could see that but God. Those around him couldn't see that at, at, at that time of darkness. Truth is, God could see Jesus' real suffering. Now the crowd around the cross, they saw the blood, they saw the agony, they heard him cry out for thirst, they heard him speak to the thief on the cross, both of them. They heard all of that, but they never really saw the real suffering that Jesus went through. They saw the blood that flowed down his face. They saw the blood that, flew, uh, that, uh, uh, it, that, that came out of his hands and his side and his feet. They saw all of that suffering. They saw as he hung there naked. His mother saw. John saw. A lot of people saw. They, they jeered at him. They sneered at him. They made fun of him. But that was not the real suffering. The real suffering nobody saw but God. It was invisible. Nobody could see it but God. Now listen to me. Truth is that God could see that real suffering. God could see the sin. Look, God could see the sin of the whole world upon his son. 
They couldn't see that. They could, but God could. God saw that. And they, they, God, would, God would see the anguish of his soul. They couldn't see that. It was invisible to everybody but God. So the real suffering was invisible except to the Heavenly Father. So the crossing of the Red Sea, now let's go back to the Red Sea for just a second. That is a picture of salvation. They were in, a, they were in Egypt, type of the world. They went through on dry ground through the Red Sea, and that's a type of salvation. But the crossing of the Jordan represents a new level of Christian living. You see, you don't have to live a defeated Christian life. Many do. You don't have to be conquered in your Christian life. Many are. And I'm telling you, there are people that are overwhelmed, but ladies and gentlemen, there is a Canaan land out there for you and I on the basis of Jesus' death on the cross. We can have victory. We can have that. So we see a memorial here. It's an invisible memorial. But then there is a visible memorial. Now let's go back to chapter 4 and look at verse number 3. We just read it. Verse number 3. And command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, now watch, and ye shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place. Now remember in verse number 9, they gathered the stones, put them all together, and left them in the midst of the Jordan. The water returned to its place. It was invisible, but, but God saw it. God saw it. And then now here, they are to take those stones, go to the banks of Canaan, and put them there for a memorial. Look, at, it says, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. So stones in the bed of the river reminds us that I died with Christ. Stones on the bank of the river reminds us that we've been risen with Jesus Christ. What a great picture of the Jordan River. We are now, ladies and gentlemen, you've been, are you saved? Amen. You know, when you get saved, you from that point, we are now to walk in the newness of Christ's resurrection. We've been saved, we're going to heaven, now live like it, right? Walk like it. Make it visible. Amen. Now you see the invisible part is what Jesus did for us in our heart. Nobody could see the work of God in my heart. That's invisible. Nobody could see the work of God in your heart. That's unseen. But I'm going to tell you what they can see. They can see that visible part. And, and they ought to see that. Look, they ought to see the visible from the working of the invisible. It ought to, it ought to manifest ourselves. It doesn't mean you carry a big, great big old Bible. <laughs> I'm a Christian, I got a great big Bible. It doesn't mean your Sunday school pin hangs from your shirt collar down to your foot. It doesn't mean that. It, it, it means that you're going to walk in the newness of life. You're going to walk away that you never walked before because something that took place in your heart that's invisible ought to manifest itself in visibility. And so here we are. We have, we have, we are, we are to go, the Hebrews tells us that we are to go on to perfection. Now, he, he just simply means go on to maturity. And all of this is visible. All of this is visible. By the way, you know what the world sees? They don't see the invisible. They see the visible, right? They see how we act. They see how we think. Or they, or they, see, how we, they see how we act. They see how we conduct ourselves. They see how we do that. But they don't see what God has done in our hearts. Only he sees that. But you know it. You know if God's working in your heart. And by the way, you and I both know when we grieve God, when we grieve the Holy Spirit. So all of this is invisible that we're looking at. So God has set up, number one, he's going to set up memorials. But number two, not only God wanted memorials, but he wanted testimonies. And we mentioned that this morning, right? Testimonies. Now look at verse number six. Chapter 4, verse number 6. There's two, two sets of testimonies that he wants. Number, look at verse 6. Chapter 4, verse 6. That this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, 
What mean ye by these stones? Now they're going, th those children are going to see the memorial, the stones that are set up on the banks of Canaan, banks of the Jordan River. And those children are going to come by and say, Daddy, what's all that mean? What does that mean? And so, verse number seven, then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. Now, there's going to be a testimony, number one, to the children. Now, do you know it's the father's responsibility to tell the story of these stones? And by the way, it's still the responsibility of fathers to tell their children about Jesus Christ. Don't you dare leave it up to the Sunday school teacher or the preacher. Fathers, daddies, it's your job to tell your children about Jesus. And listen to me, listen, and, and this, this is what is really, really scary. If you don't teach your children the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are one generation from paganism in your own family. I want you to think about that. Those folks who are interested in putting their kids in little leagues and this club and that club and this ball game and that dance class and all that, you know what? They're going to reap what they're sowing one day because their kids are going to grow up and have families of their own and they won't give a flip about Jesus Christ. Why? Because daddy didn't care much about it. Say amen right there. Y'all help me out a little bit. I'm just telling you the truth. We're, look, these folks that, if, that don't want to teach their kids about Jesus Christ, don't want to bring their kids up in Sunday school, don't want to bring their kids to church, they are one generation from paganism in their very own family. And then testimonies, not only to your children, but to the people around you. Look at verse number 21. Chapter 4, verse number 21. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on the dry land. We, that, that was already said there. We go on, verse 23. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the, river, to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we were gone over. Look at verse 24 now that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. Now, not only is there to be a testimony to your own children, but to the people around you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the world is looking at professing Christians to see if it makes any difference to know Jesus. I want you to think about that. They're looking at us to see, does it really matter if I get saved? Does it really matter if I know Jesus? They are. They don't care. They're not, as I say, say all the time, they're not, reading the, they're not reading their Bibles. If they have one, they're not reading gospel tracts. If you give them one, they're looking at you and me. And I'm telling you, some of the most obnoxious people that you can run into are people who profess to be Christians. Say amen. amen. Especially when it comes to going to a restaurant. <laughs> Something didn't go your way. It's not that waitress's fault. Why are you fussing at her for? Why are you getting on her case? I want some more, I want some more tea. Give me some more sweet tea. <laughs> Come on. You're in a suit and tie, you're in a shirt, and you, you've been dressed. Look, they know that you've come from church, and you're going to treat people that way? Amen. They, they're not going to want anything to do with Jesus, if that's what Jesus is all about. Did I hit a nerve? Well, hallelujah. <laughs> so the world is looking at professing Christians to see if it really makes a difference to know Jesus Christ. So God says... Here's a memorial, and here's testimonies to your children first, and then to those people around you. Now look at verse 18. We'll close verse 18. Back up a few, a few verses there. 
And it came to pass when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up out of the midst of Jordan, and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up unto the dry land, that the waters of Jordan returned unto their place and flowed over all his banks as they did before and went back to where it started. But God got them across. And listen, if you're going to mature in your Christian life, I don't, care what the, I don't care what the surroundings are. I don't care how wide the Jordan has spread. I don't care how it's overflowed its banks. I'm telling you what, Jesus can get you through it. Amen. He did for them, he can do for us. So are there any uncrossable rivers in your life? I'm sure there is. I'm sure you're at the brink of that river and you said, I just can't do it. Well, I know you can't, but God can. Amen. God can open up those waters and you can pass through on dry land. Amen. Amen. But you've got to trust him and you've got to let that ark go before you. Because when that ark, when they, when that priest hit the brim of that water, that water parted and they went on through dry land. And then after the people came, so that ark represents Jesus. He's, <clears throat> he's already been there. He's already trod that path. He will lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Our father, we ask your God that you'll help us to have in our mind and in our hearts that we, will, we just don't want to be stagnant. We don't want to remain still in our Christian life. We want to grow. And Father, we cannot grow by just sitting around. We'll grow by doing what you want us to do. We'll grow by trusting you. We'll grow by following you. We'll grow by doing what you would have us to do as you tell us in your precious word. Now, Father, tonight, if there's one here that needs to be saved, would you save them? And if there's some here that's facing an uncrossable river, <clears throat> help them to see tonight that you are the God of impossibilities, that there's not one thing that we face that you haven't faced already for us. We thank you, Lord, that you're our advocate. We thank you for our, uh, that you are our intercessor. So, Father, just have your way in the invitation. We ask it in Jesus' wonderful name and for his sake. Amen. 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 Let's stand. Nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus. I stand in all of your amazing ways. I worship you as long as I